from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm Rob Casper. I'm the uh, head of the Poetry and Literature Center at the Library of Congress. And uh, I'm very excited to welcome you to our second Literary Birthdays uh, series event of the spring on writer Ralph Ellison. Uh, today marks the end of Black History Month, but we are happy to honor one of our country's most celebrated and essential African-American writers today. Uh, you have a program for today's event. Uh, you can read about uh, Ellison and our featured writers. Um, of course, we could not be happier to have Jabari Asim and Danielle Evans here uh, to help us celebrate Mr. Ellison's 98th birthday. He was born in 1914. Um, for our Literary Birthday series, we usually invite a one local writer and one out-of-town writer. And today we're very happy to have Miss Evans, who is a, a rising young uh, fiction writer and a faculty member of American University in the former spot. However, for the latter, uh, we brought back an important member of the DC writing community. And I want to uh, make a special thanks to Evelyn Small uh, of the Office of Scholarly Programs uh, for helping us connect to uh, Mr. Asim. The program will go as follows. Uh, our writers will read in, in alphabetical order from their favorite Allison selections and talk about his influence on them. And they'll both also read selections of their own writing to make that kind of connection. And uh, the very exciting second part of our Literary Birthday series uh, is that after the reading, Alice Burney uh, from the Manuscripts Division of the Library uh, will come up and talk about this tabletop display that we have of uh, the Allison Collections in the Manuscript Division. And she'll also talk a little bit about uh, the division itself and its um, work uh, to uh, ensure that future generations can continue to learn about uh, the exemplars of our culture, like Mr. Ellison. So, uh, Without further ado, here is our first reader. Good afternoon. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Evelyn. Thanks to everyone who had anything to do with me returning here to a place I called home for more than a decade. Um, I'm really delighted to be here at this wonderful event in this wonderful place in this wonderful city. And I'm especially pleased to be in the company today of Danielle Evans, whose short story collection made me joyfully aware of an important new literary voice. And her presence here made this event particularly appealing to me because I thought, now I can get her to sign my book. So be warned. Um, I liked all of it, I, and I'm very fickle. I think today, Harvest is the story that's speaking to me. But if you talk to me next week, we'll probably probably be a different one, but they're all terrific, and if you're not aware of them, please make yourself aware of them. It would be well worth it. Um, in his book, Ralph Ellison in Progress, my friend Adam Bradley describes the Ellison manuscript drafts and notes housed here in the Library of Congress as an evolving record of Ellison's aesthetic vision. Bradley goes on to provide valuable insights into Ellison's creative process and explains in part how the Ellison archives came to fill such a significant and sizable space. Ellison, he writes, was a fast writer but a slow worker who often composed with ease and dignity but constructed his fiction with painstaking deliberation. He would jot down notes for characters or scenes on scraps of paper and bound notebooks and even on the backs of envelopes. Then he might write longhand riffs that he would integrate into typed drafts. He would take pen or pencil to these typed pages, putting them through scrupulous revisions, often producing half a dozen, even a dozen drafts until he was satisfied. These episodes would then be rendered in sequence with others until he assembled a continuous narrative, which he would then retype into a clean copy that he would subject to even more edits. His editor, Albert Erskine, recalls how the two of them read the entire manuscript of Invisible Man out loud, with Ellison making subtle, sometimes significant changes to the text. Bradley describes the process as reflecting a spirit of substitution, extenuation, and adornment. Reading Bradley's account reminded me of one of Ellison's comments about the purpose of art. 
In his essay, That Same Pain, That Same Pleasure, he wrote, I think that the mixture of the marvelous and the terrible is a basic condition of human life. And the persistence of human ideals represents the marvelous pulling itself up out of the chaos of the universe. From the chaos of his jumbled manuscripts, scribbled musings, tattered envelopes, stacked notebooks, and meticulous revisions, Ellison reliably surfaced with prose that can be justifiably described as the marvelous made manifest. In Ellison's view of art, compelling prose, whether fiction or nonfiction, couldn't approach the marvelous without approximating the majesty of the blues. It had to at once express both the agony of life and the possibility of conquering it through sheer toughness of spirit. What's more, it had to do so not because of a political position embraced at the time, but because of a larger concern with the tragic struggle of humanity. Conquest through sheer toughness of spirit resonates powerfully throughout Invisible Man, but no less so through his early attempts at short fiction. Afternoon, for example, is a slice of life tale written in 1940 featuring Buster and Riley, two characters who occupy center stage and at least three of his collected stories. In those stories, the boys try on a variety of masks and performance styles as test flights for forays into the complicated and unpredictable world they must soon navigate as men. I'll read a couple of scenes from Afternoon, followed by a passage from a story of mine called The Genius, inspired in part by Ellison's story. And I should preface my reading by uh, sort of apologizing in advance because it will contain a few words that may be offensive to some, um, but are honest to Ellison's own language. So this is from Afternoon. The two boys stood at the rear of a vacant lot looking up at a telephone pole. The wires strung from one pole to the next gleamed bright copper in the summer sun. Glints of green light shot from the pole's glass insulator as the boys stared. Funny ain't no birds on them wires, huh? They got too much electricity in them. You can even hear them hum they got so much. Riley cocked his head, listening. That's what's making that noise, he said. Show, sure, man, just like if you put your ear against a streetcar line pole, you can tell when the car's coming. You don't even have to see it, Buster said. That's right, I know about that. Wonder why they have them glass things up there. To keep them guys what climbs up there from getting shocked, I guess. Riley caught the creosote smell of the black paint on the pole as his eyes traveled over its rough surface. High as a bitch, he said. It ain't so high, I bet I can't hit that glass on the end there. Buster, you full of brown. You can't hit that glass. It's too high. Shucks, give me a rock. They looked slowly over the dry ground for a rock. Here's a good one, Riley called, an egg rock. Throw it here and watch how old Lou Gehrig snags them on first base. Riley pitched. The rock came high and swift. Buster stretched his arm to catch it and kicked out his right leg behind him, touching base. And he's out on first, he cried. You got him all right, Riley said. You just watch this. Riley watched as Buster wound up his arm and pointed to the insulator with his left hand. His body gave a twist and the rock flew upward. Crack. Pieces of green, grass, spr green glass sprinkled down. They stood with hands on hips. Looking about them, a bird twittered, a rooster crowed. No one shouted to them, and they laughed nervously. Come on over to my house and sit in the cool, Buster said. They turned a corner and walked into a short stretch of grassy yard before a gray cottage. A breeze blew across the porch. It smelled clean and fresh to Riley. The wooden boards of the porch had been washed white. Buster remembered seeing his mother scrubbing the porch with the suds after she had finished the clothes. He tried to forget those clothes. A fly buzzed at the door screen. Riley dropped down on the porch, his bare feet dangling. Wait a minute while I see what's here to eat, Buster said. Riley lay back and covered his eyes with his arm. All right, he said. Buster went inside, fanning flies away from the door. 
He could hear his mother busy in the kitchen as he walked through the little house. She was standing before the window, ironing. When he stepped down into the kitchen, she turned her head. Buster, where you been, you lazy rascal? You know I wanted you here to help me with them tubs. I was over to Riley's Ma. I didn't know you wanted me. You didn't know? Lord, I don't know why I had to have a child like you. I worked my fingers to the bone to keep you looking decent, and that's the way you appreciates it. You didn't know. Buster was silent. It was always this way. He had meant to help. He always meant to do the right thing, but something always got in the way. Well, what you standing there looking like a dying calf for? I'm through now. Go on out and play. Yes, sir. He turned and walked slowly out of the back door. The cat arched its back against his leg as he went off the porch, stepping gingerly over the sun-heated boards. The ground around the steps was still moist and white, where Ma had poured the suds. A stream of water trickled rapidly from the hydrant, sparkling silver in the sunlight. Suddenly, he remembered why he had gone into the house. He stopped and called, Ma, what you want? Ma, what we gonna have for supper? Lord, all you think about is your gut. I don't know. Come on back in here and fix you some eggs if you hungry. I'm too busy to stop. And for the Lord's sake, leave me alone. Buster hesitated. He was hungry, but he could not stay around Ma when she was like this. She was like this whenever something went wrong with her and the white folks. Her voice had been like a slap in the face. He started slowly around to the front of the house. The dust was thick and warm to his feet. Looking down, he broke a sprig of milkweed between his bare toes and watched the green stem slowly bleeding white sap upon the brown earth. A tiny globe of milk glistened on his toe, and as he walked to the front of the house, he dug his foot into the dry dust, leaving the sap a small spot of mud. He dropped down beside Riley. You eat so quick? asked Riley. Nah, Ma's mad at me. Don't pay that no mind, man. My folks is always after me. They think all a man wants to do is what they want him to. You ought to be glad you ain't got no old man like I got. Is he very mean? My old man's so mean he hates himself. <laughs> Ma's bad enough. Let them white folks make her mad where she works and I catch hell. My old man's the same way. Boy, and can he beat you. One night he come home from work and was going to beat my ass with a piece of electricity wire. But my old lady stopped him, told him he bet not. Wonder why they so mean, Buster said. Damn if I know. My old man says we don't get enough beatings these days. He said grandma used to tie him up in a gunny sack and smoke him like they do hams. <laughs> he was going to do that to me. But Ma stopped him. She said, don't you come treating no child of mine like no slave. Your Ma might have raised you like a slave, but I ain't raising him like that. And you bet not harm a hair on his head. And he didn't do it neither. Man, was I glad. Damn, I'm glad I don't have no old man, Buster said. You just wait till I get big. Boy, I'm going to beat the hell out of my old man. I'm going to learn to box like Jack Johnson, just so I can beat his ass. Jack Johnson, first colored heavyweight champion of the whole wide world, Buster said. Wonder where he is now. I don't know. Up north in New York, I guess. But I bet wherever he is, ain't nobody messing with him. You mighty right. I heard my Uncle Luke say Jack Johnson was a better fighter than Joe Lewis. Said he was fast as a cat on his feet. Fast as a cat. Gee, you can throw a cat off the top of a house and he'll land on his feet. <laughs> Why, by golly, I bet you could throw a cat down from heaven and the son of a bitch would land right side up. My old man's always singing. If it hadn't have been for the referee, Jack Johnson would have killed Jim Jeffery, Riley said. The afternoon was growing old. The sun hung low in a cloudless sky and soon would be lost behind the fringe of trees across the street. A faint wind blew and the leaves on the trees trembled in the sun. They were silent now. A black and yellow wasp flew beneath the eaves, droning. Buster watched it disappear inside his gray honeycomb-like nest, then rested back on his elbows and crossed his legs, thinking of Jack Johnson. A screen slammed loudly somewhere down the street. Riley lay beside him, whistling a tune between his teeth. 
And that's from Afternoon by Ellison, early story, 1940, um, which may have been lingering a little bit in my mind as I composed the story many years later uh, called The Genius. And I'll have a couple of explanatory notes about that as I begin. Uh, the story is about a boy named Roderick Bates, whose nickname is The Genius. Uh, and like Ellison's story, mine is about two boys trying on masks. In this passage, Roderick and Crispus are bonding over a pint of ice cream. They have gathered behind a neighborhood store called D&E. Uh, Crispus's older brother is mentioned. His name is Schomburg. And they're confronted by a local bully named Bumpy Decatur, who mentions his younger sister, whose name is Lala. So there'll be mentions of a couple of characters that don't actually appear in this sequence. Roderick, I'm sorry, Crispus followed Roderick outside and around to the back of the store. They sat in the shade, facing the alley. He pulled a pint of ice cream from his sack. Crispus recognized the purple seal test carton. Chocolate ripple, right? Roderick brandished two flat wooden spoons and smiled. For show, Crispus said. He reached for the offered carton and quickly flipped it open. That's not all, Roderick said. He reached in the sack again and produced two small, tightly wrapped packages. Baseball cards, he said triumphantly. He tossed the pack to Crispus. Crispus opened it and let out a whoop. Man, oh man, Kurt Flood and Lou Brock in the same pack. Roderick laughed. Looks like today's your lucky day. The two friends relaxed and enjoyed their cool treat. Crispus amused Roderick by imitating Schomburg, slurping enthusiastically and smacking his lips. The sun overhead beamed intensely, making it warm even in the shade. Crispus examined the back of the Lou Brock card. All right, he said, tell me what you know. Roderick closed his eyes. Okay. Middle name is Clark. Born June 18, 1939 in El Dorado, Arkansas. Bats left, throws left. 5'11", 170 pounds. Crispus nodded his approval. Good. Now, what's so special about 1962? Easy. First full season in the majors. Played 123 games. Struggled a bit at the plate. Although an average of 263 is nothing to sneeze at. And he already showed clear indication of his brilliant speed with 16 stolen bases. Crispus shook his head. Man, oh man, how do you have time to learn all this stuff? No, it's nada. It's nothing. And I don't try to learn it. I just do. It's not like balancing equations or anything. If I see the back of the card, I can usually manage to see it again in my head. Crispus smiled. I guess that's why they call you the, well, looky here, if it ain't the motherfucking genius. Crispus immediately recognized the voice as belonging to Bumpy Decatur. He didn't want to look up, but he had to, into the leering faces of Bumpy and his brother Darwin. He ain't no genius, Darwin said. That punk be faking. He don't know shit. Roderick said nothing. Crispus extended the purple carton. Y'all want some ice cream? Shut up, bean shots, Bumpy said. He said it with such violence the spit flew from his mouth and just missed Crispus. This ain't about your nappy-headed ass. You lucky Lala ain't here, or I'd let her beat the shit out of you. He turned to Roderick. Stand your ass up when I'm talking to you. Roderick reluctantly complied. Everybody always going around talking about you a genius. What you think? Is you one? Roderick sighed. Genius is relative, he said. <laughs> the witty Roderick was fast disappearing. The muttering Roderick was taking over. Darwin snorted and snarled with the confidence of a bully who has many brothers. We ain't talking about your goddamn relatives. I'm talking about your sorry ass. <laughs> Bumpy laughed and shoved Roderick. He ain't got no relatives nowhere except his crazy ass mama. That bitch ain't nothing but a dope fiend. What did you say? Something in Roderick's tone made Crispus look up at his friend. Muttering Roderick was gone, just like that. You heard me. I said that bitch ain't. Bumpy grunted as he fell, hitting the ground before he could finish the sentence. There was a moment of silent astonishment as he rubbed his jaw and stared at Roderick, who was studying his own fist as if it belonged to someone else. 
Crispus rose to his feet, ready to run. Roderick tried to explain. Look, I, oh no, Bumpy said. He was grinning now. That's my game for show. Darwin grabbed Roderick and held his arms. Bumpy moved so fast that Crispus didn't register the fact of his motion until he had pulled back, a flash of silver glinting in his hand. Roderick slumped. Teach you to mess with me, bastard, Bumpy shouted. Come on, Bumps, let's go. They took off in a flurry of footsteps. Crispus turned to Roderick. He was slowly sliding down the wall, eyes open. His hand pressed against his shirt. Between his fingers, a trickle of blood. Roderick, did he stab me? Roderick gasped. I think it was a screwdriver. Man, oh man, what should I do? Get one of those pallets over there. Elevate my feet. Several pallets leaned against the wall next to the back door of D&E. Crispus knocked one down and dragged it over to Roderick. He lifted his friend's feet and placed them on top. Good, Roderick said. Now get help. No way. Crispus protested. I'm not leaving you here. Forget about it. Roderick smiled despite his pain. His fingers were now wet and red. I'm not going to die, he said. I'm pretty sure he didn't get any of my internal organs. You sure? Pretty sure. Pretty sure? What kind of sure is that? Hey, are you doubting the genius? The back door of D&E burst open. The butcher ran out in a crimson spattered apron. I hear you little cretins, always loitering in back of the store. This ain't your house, so go home, why don't you? He paused, taking note of the small boy kneeling beside his stricken friend, the wet hand on the shirt, the buttons misaligned. Jesus God, he said. I'll get help. I'll call the cops. He ran back inside. Hear that? Help is coming. Roderick chuckled weakly. Crispus somehow knew that he should keep him talking. Why are you laughing? We got a serious situation here. I was just thinking how good it would be to see my mother right now. Makes sense to me, Crispus said, but Roderick didn't hear him. It's funny, he said. All my life I've wished and wished for a father. And now I can't think about anything else but my mama. He closed his eyes. Do you hear me, mother? La necesito, mama. The genius continued to laugh. The blood continued to ooze, slowly and thickly, like chocolate ripple melting in the sun. That's that. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Is there, if there's a way to use a microphone wrong, I will do it. So can everyone hear me okay? Um, great. Uh, thank you all for coming out and, and thank the Library of Congress for putting this together and for inviting me to be a part of it. It is such an honor to be here and to be in such fine company. Um, in my day job, I teach at American University and one of the courses I teach is African American literature, which means among other things that I get the pleasure of rediscovering Ellison every year when I teach Invisible Man. By some cruel trick of the semester calendar, it always ends up that they're in the middle of writing their midterm papers at the same time that we start reading Invisible Man. So I just had to give my annual lecture discouraging them from abandoning their selected midterm topics and writing about Invisible Man instead. And while I'm gratified that every year I get this outpouring of love for the book, I have to tell them that for a lot of them, writing about it is like writing about a new love. There is no critical distance. There is no acknowledgment of all the things that they don't know yet. Um, I can sympathize with that. I, I too felt understood by the book before I actually understood it. Uh, before I loved Ellison as a writer, before I loved him for how brilliantly structured that book is or how insightfully he could talk about being a writer in America, being black in America, and particularly being a black writer in America, I loved him because he had words for the things I'd always felt but never knew how to name. In the introduction to Invisible Man, and I, I don't have, I have my copy like this because my, my actual copy of Invisible Man I stole from my cousin like years and years ago <laughs> when she was, she had, she passed it down because she read it in high school and, and was done with it. Um, and it's literally held together with tape and, um, and a little bit of glue. And I thought I can't walk into the Library of Congress with this abused book. <laughs> They'll arrest me for book abuse or something. <laughs> so I photocopied what I wanted to read. Uh, but this is from the introduction to Invisible Man. Ellison says, 
In fact, it seemed to tease me with allusions to that pseudoscientific sociological concept, which held that most Afro-American difficulties sprang from our, quote, high visibility, a phrase as double-dealing and insidious as its more recent oxymoronic cousins, quote, benign neglect and, quote, reverse discrimination, both of which translate, keep those Negroes running, but in their same old place. <laughs> My friends had made wry jokes out of the term for many years, suggesting that while the darker brother was clearly, quote, checked and balanced and kept far more checked than balanced, on the basis of his darkness, he glowed, nevertheless, within the American conscience with such intensity that most whites feigned moral blindness toward his predicament. And these included the waves of late arrivals who refused to recognize the vast extent to which they too benefited from his second class status while placing all of the blame on white southerners. <clears throat> Thus, despite the bland assertions of sociologists, high visibility actually rendered one unvisible, whether at high noon in Macy's window or illuminated by the flaming torches and flashbulbs while undergoing the ritual sacrifice that was dedicated to the ideal of white supremacy. After such knowledge and given the persistence of racial violence and the unavailability of legal protection, I asked myself, what else was there to sustain our will to persevere but laughter? That sense of being so highly visible that you can't actually be seen had been with me most of my life and I was astonished to discover that someone had found out about it and put it in a book. Um, so because I love that book so much and, and it seemed appropriate to bring it up in this speech, I'm going to read a few of my favorite passages from Invisible Man. Um, probably if you're here, you have read them before, but it, um, this is the, the, I'm going to start with the section where he comes upon the elderly couple being evicted um, and describes the scene before him. Something had been working fiercely inside me, and for a moment I had forgotten the rest of the crowd. Now I recognized a self-consciousness about them, as though they, we, were ashamed to witness the eviction, as though we were all unwilling intruders upon some shameful event, and thus we were careful not to touch or stare too hard at the effects that line the curb, for we were witnesses of what we did not wish to see, though curious, fascinated despite our shame, and through it all, the old female mind-plunging crying. I looked at the old people, feeling my eyes burn, my throat tighten. The old woman sobbing was having a strange effect upon me, as when a child, seeing the tears of its parents, is moved by both fear and sympathy to cry. I turned away, feeling myself drawn to the old couple by a warm, dark, rising whirlpool of emotion which I feared. I was wary of what the sight of them, crying there on the sidewalk, was making me begin to feel. I wanted to leave, but was too ashamed to leave, was rapidly becoming too much a part of it to leave. I turned aside and looked at the clutter of the household objects which the two men continued to pile on the walk. And as the crowd pushed me, I looked down to see, looking out of an oval frame, a portrait of the old couple when young, seeing the sad, stiff dignity of the faces there, feeling strange memories awakening that began an echoing in my head like that of a hysterical voice stuttering in a dark street. Seeing them look back at me as though even in that 19th century day they had expected little, and this with a grim, unillusioned pride that suddenly seemed to me both a reproach and a warning. My eyes fell upon a pair of crudely carved and polished bones, knocking bones, used to accompany music at country dances, used in blackface minstrels, the flat ribs of a cow, a steer, or sheep, flat bones that gave off a sound when struck like heavy castanets, had he been a minstrel, or the wooden block of a set of drums. Pots and pots of green plants were lined in the dirty snow, certain to die of the cold, ivy, canna, a tomato plant. And in a basket, I saw a straightening comb, switches of false hair, a curling iron, a card with silvery letters against a background of dark red velvet reading, God bless our home. And scattered across the top of a chiffonier were nuggets of High John the Conqueror, the lucky stoned. And as I watched the white men put down a basket in which I saw a whiskey bottle filled with rock candy and camphor, a small Ethiopian flag, a faded tin type of Abraham Lincoln, and the smiling image of a Hollywood star torn from a magazine. And on a pillow, several badly cracked pieces of delicate china, a commemorative plate celebrating the St. Louis World's Fair. I stood in kind of a daze, looking at an old folded lace fan, studded with jet and mother of pearl. The crowd surged as the white men came back, knocking over a drawer that spilled its contents in the snow at my feet. I stopped, I, I stooped, and starting repl started re replacing the articles, a bent Masonic emblem, a set of starnished, tarnished cufflinks, three bass brass rings, a dime pierced with a nail hole, so as to be worn about the ankle on a string for luck, an ornate greeting card with the message, Grandma, I love you, in childish scrawl, 
another card with a picture of what looked like a white man in a black face seated in the door of a cabin strumming a banjo beneath a bar of music and the lyric going back to my old cabin home. A useless inhalant, a string of bright bleed glass with a tarnished clasp, a rabbit foot, a celluloid baseball scoring card shaped like a catcher's mitt, registering a game won or lost years ago, an old breast pump with rubber bulb yellowed with age, a worn baby shoe, and a dusty lock of infant hair tied with a faded and crumpled blue ribbon. I felt nauseated. In my hand, I held three lapsed life insurance policies with perforated seals stamped void, a yellowing newspaper portrait of a huge black man with the caption, Marcus Garvey deported. I turned away, bending and searching the dirty snow for anything missed by my eyes, and my fingers closed upon something resting in a frozen footstep, a fragile paper coming apart with age, written in black ink grown yellow. I read, free papers. Be it known to all men that my Negro, Primus Provo, has been freed by me this 6th day of August, 1859, signed John Samuels Macon. I folded it quickly, blotting out the single drop of melted snow, which glistened on the yellow page, and dropped it back into the drawer. My hands were trembling, my breath rasping as if I had run a long distance or come upon a coiled snake in a busy street. It has been longer than that, further removed in time, I told myself, and yet I knew that it hadn't been. I replaced the drawer in the chest and pushed drunkenly to the curb. I'm always amazed by the level of detail in that passage, by the use of the language, the use of the image, but also that ending note, it has been longer than that, further removed in time. How long we felt that way and how close it always seems. Ellison, I think, perhaps more than any writer, does such a good job of showing the way that we are always haunted by the American past in this country, um, and, and for that, I come to him again and again and, and thinking about the ways that we can feel the past in the present. I also think even in his writing, even in his creative work, Ellison is always thinking about how to tell those stories. So I'm going to read another very short passage from later in the book. I came out of the subway weak, moving through the heat as though I carried a heavy stone, the weight of a mountain on my shoulders. My new shoes hurt my feet. Now, moving through the crowds along 125th Street, I was painfully aware of other men dressed like boys and of girls in dark, exotic colored stockings, their costumes surreal variations of downtown styles. They'd been there all along, but somehow I'd missed them. I'd missed them even when my work had been most successful. They were outside the groove of history, and it was my job to get them in, all of them. I looked into the design of their faces, hardly a one that was unlike someone I'd known down south. Forgotten names sang through my head like forgotten scenes in dreams. I moved with the crowd, the sweat pouring off of me, listening to the grinding roar of traffic, the growing sound of a record shop loudspeaker blaring a languid blues. I stopped. Was this all that would be recorded? Was this the only true history of the times, a mood blared by trumpets, trombones, saxophones, and drums, a song with turgid, inadequate words? My mind flowed. It was as though in this short block, I was forced to walk past everyone I'd ever known, and no one would smile or call my name. But after I loved Ellison for writing such eloquent words, I loved him for the way that he made me think about writing and the project of being a writer. Structure, I think, is the last thing writers learn to love about writing, because if it's working well, you don't see it. In a book like Invisible Man, there is such pleasure in the sentence by sentence that it can be a second or third or fourth read before you realize just how intricately crafted it is. But when you do, the amount of work that had to go in into putting all those pieces together is astounding. If Ellison's use of structure gives the writer a certain challenge, a sense that fiction is indeed, as he says, a very stern discipline, it's also true that Ellison gives writers certain important and explicit permissions. In an interview with Harper's Magazine, he says, I mean that it is futile to argue our humanity with those who willfully refuse to recognize it. When art can reveal on its own terms more truth while providing pleasure, insight, and for Negro readers at least, affirmation and a sense of direction. We must assert our own sense of values, beginning with the given and irrevocable, with the question of heroism and slavery. Contrary to some, I feel that our experience as a people involves a great deal of heroism. From one perspective, slavery was horrible and brutalizing. It is said, Quote, those Africans were enslaved, they died in the Middle Passage, they were abused, their families were separated, they were, whipped, they were raped, ravaged, and emasculated. And the Negro writer is tempted to agree, yes, goddammit, wasn't that a horrible thing? But he sometimes agrees to the next step, which hold that, holds that slaves had very little humanity because slavery destroyed it for them and their descendants. That's what the Stanley Elkins Sambo argument implies. 
But despite the historical past and the injustices of the present, from my perspective, there is something further to say. I have to affirm my forefathers and I must affirm my parents or be reduced in my own mind to a white man's inadequate, even if unprejudiced, conception of human complexity. Yes, and I must affirm those unknown people who sacrificed for me. I'm speaking of those Negro Americans who never knew that a Ralph Ellison might exist, but who by living their own lives and refusing to be destroyed by social injustice and white supremacy, real or illusory, made it possible for me to live my own life with meaning. I am forced to look at these people and upon the history of life in the United States and conclude that there is another reality behind the appearance of reality which they would force upon us as truth. Any people who could endure all of that brutalization and keep together, who could undergo such dismemberment, resuscitate itself, and endure until it could take the intu initiative in achieving its own freedom is obviously more than the sum of its brutalization. Seen in this perspective, theirs has been one of the greatest human experiences and one of the greatest triumphs of the human spirit in modern times, in fact, in the history of the world. It is tremendously liberating to be able to say to yourself, I am not writing for people who do not recognize my humanity. It is in fact that that allows me as a writer to be able to create black characters who are fully human, who are sometimes flawed and foolish, who speak in different registers, who find themselves frequently stumbling in their quest to make sense of themselves and their country. That I think is the second permission that Ellison has given me as a writer. The permission to dare to try to make sense of America, to write fiction that is about the individual, but also necessarily about the society that produces and restricts individuals, about the ways in which private existence becomes by necessity performative in accordance with social expectations or in resistance to social restrictions. I take from Ellison that the project of the writer in the US is to take on the task of telling this country's story. So, you know, I got this email inviting me to this event and I was really excited to be included and to be honored and I'm reading, like, yes, I can talk about Ralph Ellison. Yes, I can read my favorite Ellison passages. And then I got to the part that was like, and then we'd like you to read some of your own work. And I was like, hold up. <laughs> so you want, you want me to read my work to an audience that just heard a lot of Ralph Ellison. It's like being invited to, to be in a beauty contest with Beyonce, right? Like I'm cute, but I'm not stupid. <laughs> um, but but if, we, if we take anything from Ellison, it's a little bit of boldness. The writer's job is never to be shy. So I'm going to read a bit from the very opening of my novel in progress. Um, because it's from the opening, you don't need a ton of context, um, but since you don't have it in front of you, if it were in front of you, you would be able to see that the very opening is actually, um, one of the characters keeps a travel blog, so the very opening is actually a blog post, and then we move into chapter one. So I will say chapter one, and you will know that, that changed. The central metaphor for the American experiment is not a patchwork quilt or a pot of multicolored melting wax, but a railroad car on the way to California, a thing built with blood shaped by the whims of commerce, contested over and over again in the courts, a site of socialization, a site of social contestation, a thing heading forward in stubborn denial of the fact that its destination could be gradually falling into the sea. I had a professor once who argued that the embrace of the automobile implied a certain bargain with death, a clear-eyed acceptance that we were willing to accept a daily risk of dying in exchange for a certain level of comfort and convenience. If this is true, then it is also true that trains helped, us, helped get us there. From Philadelphia to California, there are literally bodies underneath the tracks, many of those of the railroad workers who were building the tracks before there were even trains running on them. Then, of course, you had your crashers and your stagecoach robberies and your coal miners' lung. But there was always a glamour in trains, a sexiness outside of the Freudian sense. It's no accident that some of the earliest lawsuits in the country centered on trains. The ability to be employed on trains with dignity. The ability to sit in the lady's car if one was the wrong color to be considered a lady. The ability to be free if a train had taken you through free, through free territory. Part of the romance of trains is that they move people forward in more sense than one. The fact that trains are now largely inefficient ways to travel only emphasizes their romantic aspects. West of Chicago, trains are now vehicles of leisure, not efficiency. If you want to be on time, you drive somewhere. The passenger trains don't own the tracks, which means that by law, freight trains have to, must pass first. Before this trip, I'd only been in the middle of a country a few times, just enough to know that the Midwest is not, in fact, a Jedi mind trick to make the US look bigger on world maps, as my former roommate alleged once when I told her I was on my way to a conference in Kansas. I've been taking trains up and down the East Coast all of my life, and before this trip, they were responsible for my general impressions of train travel. Trains leave hourly, and absent disaster, arrive within half an hour of their scheduled time. Once, my train from DC to New York was 45 minutes late because a man near Philadelphia jumped in front of the tracks. The woman next to me spent the last hour of the trip on her cell phone with Amtrak, loudly demanding her money back. I read later that the man died. 
So looking outside the window, looking out the window at Omaha, where we've been stopped for the last two hours, I can't help but be a little unsettled. The train is currently nine hours behind schedule. And truth be told, I'm a little shocked that there are still this many people in the country who can take a nine hour delay in stride. <laughs> Luckily, I'm not in a hurry to get anywhere except out of New York. I used to have a job there and now I don't. I used to be finishing my dissertation and now I'm done. I used to have a boyfriend and now he's married and living in Tennessee. I ran out of things to tether me to the city and so it seemed as good a time as any to leave. The luxury of having a country with so much space in it is that every asshole who's read on the road thinks they can head to California and be a different person by the time they get there. <laughs> in America, we like our origin stories and you could construct a good one about trains, from the steel workers to the railroad barons to the private car owners to the hobos, and another about the West itself. Either of those would ultimately be a story of expansive motion, of going somewhere, even if you first had to violently invent a place to go. It is no accident that in our country's mythology, we've replaced the European prince on a white stallion with the cowboy, rugged, untethered, and most importantly, always on the verge of leaving. Fall for a cowboy and there is no palace to aspire to. You are either going to learn to let him go, or you are going to leave what you know and ride off into the jagged, bleeding sunset with him. We have a romance with movement, a love affair with departure. Our national bedtime story is the story that you can go somewhere, and historically, somewhere has been west. So my trip begins with heading west. Chapter one. It was the summer of burning things, of trash can fires and blazing mattresses, of sofas and old recliners, and piles of clothing gone to ash in alleyways, with such frequency that whole sections of the city smelled vaguely of lighter fluid some days. Bed bugs was the official explanation. They'd arrived in mass, a tiny blood-sucking army bent on keeping the populace awake at night. Maybe it was the bed bugs to some degree. They had become so bold and proliferate that even in the most upscale of apartments and restaurants, it was not unusual to see them crawling across the floor in broad daylight. It had become nearly impossible to take the metro without a telltale red welt appearing hours or days or weeks later. But it was also the heat which spread both the fires and the desire to burn things, and the restlessness of living in a time and place where one vague threat came after another so frequently that it was like being eternally held ransom by an easily distracted madman. There was an existential panic that frequently faded into collective on me, a communal sense of, fuck it, we are all going to die. <laughs> it was not unusual that summer to see people in a state of undress, to see children and teenagers wandering the streets in swimwear in search of fountains or broken hydrants, to see adults sunbathing and clothing covering only the bare minimum percentage of body, to see, often enough that it stopped being startling, someone stripping off last night's bar clothes on their own front porch and lighting them on fire in a front yard trash can before waltzing nearly naked through the front door. Although they had all been told the bedbugs had nothing to do with cleanliness, there was a great deal of suspicion regarding the sanitary habits of the general public, and one night stands and paramours were not to be trusted. It was cheaper to throw out a polo shirt or cocktail dress than to radiate one's apartment. So ubiquitous were the underdressed young people that when he first saw her, it took Phil a minute to understand that the blonde girl in her underwear was protesting anything other than summer filth or atmospheric inconvenience. She looked about 20, and he decided she must be crazy or Midwestern. No local in her right mind would plan an outdoor protest in DC in July. It was 114 degrees with the heat index, and so humid that things in the distance seemed hazy. Her skin was reddened and damp and doughy. Her white bra soaked through with sweat. Her name, he discovered by reading the poster board she'd propped up next to her, was Diana, and she was opposed to the war. Or wars? Her sign was not especially clear in the first place, and had since been defaced. Once by a group of interns who had taped the detritus of their picnic lunch, waxy white sandwich wrappers and empty paper cups and glittering foil chip bags to her sad billboard. Once by someone who had scrawled in red marker, for a good time, call me, along with an arrow pointing in Diana's direction. And once by someone who had scrolled in magic marker, hunger strike, bitch, you need a diet. Phil had never had any children, and now that he was on the other side of 50, it seemed unlikely that he ever would. But he imagined that if he had, he would have felt something for them like what he felt for Diana in that moment. A desire to protect her from something she didn't even know was out there, and a competing desire to let her survive this on her own and prove him wrong. Ultimately, the first instinct won out. He bounded across the park to buy a bottle of water from a hot dog vendor on the corner, and then returned to the section of the park where Diana sat. She looked defeated, wilted, and sticky, but something about her reminded Phil of a feral cat an ex-girlfriend of his had once tried to trap and take to the vet, wary enough to strike when cornered. And so he approached her slowly, the water bottle held out in front of him as a peace offering to dissuade her from cursing or spitting or running. Hello, he said, I'm Phil. She cocked her head to the side. Up close, he could see the dark roots on the top of her scalp, more than an inch, not quite two, a fault line of polish, indicating that her life had recently been divided into a before and an after. I'm on a hunger strike, Diana said. 
Her voice came out hoarse and raspy, and he couldn't tell if it was the exhaustion or a sign that she had been shouting at some point in the recent past. You're not on a water strike, you'd be dead by now, said Phil. Also, forgive me for saying so, but your hunger strike doesn't seem to be particularly effective so far. I'm waiting for the president to come down. I have a letter for her. The president is in Rome. There's no news in Rome? Honey, there's no news in the world that's worried about you right now. Have you seen any reporters? How would I know if I had seen them? For all I know, you're a reporter. For all you know, I'm Santa Claus, but I wouldn't count on him showing up either. Let me get you a cup of coffee and we'll talk about how you can do this right the next time, okay? She looked up at him momentarily defiant. Sit with me, she said. You want to tell me what I'm doing wrong? You can tell me here. Why don't you first try to tell me, why don't you first tell me what it is you're trying to do? My brother is dead, she said, and I think Madam President owes me an explanation. Phil looked away from her out of consideration. Half naked was one thing, but she seemed like the kind of person who would never forgive you for having seen her cry. He let her words hover for a moment and remained seated beside her. Passersby stopped at a distance and looked startled, the image of the near-naked white girl and the older black man in cockies and linen buttoned down, but few of them came close enough to find out what it was about. Somehow his presence had driven their impression of the protest from amusing to tawdry. With all due respect, Phil said finally, your brother is going to be dead for a very long time. Long enough for you to have some lunch and talk about the right way to do this. It took her a few minutes to concede the point, but finally she grabbed for the dusty backpack beside her and fished through it until she emerged with a worn yellow sundress and wiggled it over her head. The dress was a smidge too tight. It hitched up centimeter by centimeter above her thighs as she walked, and in the front the fabric was so flimsy you could still see the clear outlines of her nipples, but she was at least decent enough for them to walk up to 16th Street and hail a cab. In the taxi, Diana seemed to wilt a bit against the window glass. Outside, downtown loomed, free rush hour, post-lunch hour, and so relatively quiet. The fatigue of the failed protest seemed to have caught up with her, but not enough to take the edge off her natural curiosity about the city. Phil almost didn't know what to tell her anymore. People like to draw dividing lines in DC. DC versus Washington, black DC versus white DC, DC proper versus DC metro. But the only division that had made, ever made categorical sense to Phil was permanent DC versus temporary DC. The people for whom DC was home in some lasting sense that they would never get away from versus the people who came to DC for six months or two years or 10 years, but knew that they were only there as long as their company retained the contract or their boss stayed in office or their grant money lasted. Temporary DC was permanent in its own right. There would always be a new crop of interns and legislative assistants and appointees, young people with decent incomes or trust funds, and no long-term designs on the city, no ties to what it had been or even what it would be. And then, of course, people like Diana, kids who came here with the idea they'd change something and go home, pile into group houses and run their protests or NGOs and charities, and then leave after the revolution. So because it could, DC had flourished in the ephemeral sense and left the infrastructure more or less alone. It tore down abandoned buildings and built glossy condos. It added boutique grocery stores and small plate restaurants and extra cops in the neighborhoods where these things existed, but did little in the way of less glamorous development, left most of its schools and prisons as they had been for decades, tried to annex what problems it could to the southeast quadrant of the city and the nearby Maryland suburbs. If Washington was the eternal mistress of cities, sleek, glossy, replaceable, built for people who came to it knowing they would leave someday, then it was also the aging, abandoned wife. She might be stuck where she was, but you would never really get away from her either, never really get away from the knowledge of what you'd done to her or what she'd done for you. Phil thought sometimes that you could map the city simply by asking people to tell you what DC used to be. I'd like to begin with a, a small correction to the uh, program. The items on the table are not from the Hughes collection, but from the Ralph Ellison collection. That was something left over from last month. Uh, I brought today just a few examples from the writings and correspondence series of our Ellison papers in the manuscript division. What else is in the manuscript division? I, I deal only with literary and artistic materials, cultural materials. Uh, of course, the manuscript division has been in existence over a century and, and uh, boasts the holding of 23, the papers of 23 early American presidents and other documents of uh, American culture, uh, Supreme Court justices, uh, women's suffrage figures, Margaret Sanger, uh, Margaret Mead, and then we have the world's largest Whitman collection. 
and I could go on and on with that, but there's time today only for Ellison. The library's vast research collection of manuscripts, drafts, and notes for published and unpublished works by Ralph Ellison also includes family papers, speeches, notebooks, lectures, subject files, photographs, recordings, and his working library in other divisions, and a flute. <laughs> Not that he played the flute. He played the cornet. Although Ellison produced several volumes of stories and essays, as you know, uh, it was Invisible Man that made, made him uh, his fame and established the genre of the African-American novel of identity and made him the major, a major American author, respected worldwide. He, by the way, wished to be known as an American author and not an African-American author in spite of his focus on race relations in the country. Ellison, of course, held t uh, teaching posts at 10 universities. Some of that is in your program. He lectured at the Library of Congress in 1964, served as the library's honorary consultant in American letters from 1966 to 72, and returned in 1983 to read from his drafts of his novel in progress some of which documentation I have on the table. The first part of his collection was officially described in 1997, two years after I traveled to the Harlem apartment of the grieving widow and began transferring materials to the library. Part two was added in 2010 and has been very little used by scholars. They forget to look at the back of the finding aid. Even the biographer, Arnold Rampersad, did not see its additional 83 boxes. We didn't have them at that point. The manuscript collection now holds 74,800 items in a total of 314 archival boxes. In part two of the collection, I found evidence that other repositories had pursued Ellison's papers, Howard University, Boston, Brooklyn College, University of Oregon, and the Lilly Library in Indiana. But a friend at Wil Colonial Williamsburg, with, with which uh, Ellison was affiliated, highly recommended the Library of Congress as his official repository. Mrs. Ellison and two previously named estate trustees made the final selection the year after his death. Literary executor John Callahan, professor in Oregon, worked with the manuscript division on terms for administering the complex of deposits, gifts, and purchases. For many years, access, like 15 years, access was highly restricted, and because of the need to track permissions, I became acutely aware that it, this has been our most used literary collection since 1997. The selections on, on display on the table today omit family papers, organizational papers, and reference series, all of these very rich. He was very active in many cultural organizations, and he maintained running files on subjects from civil rights to jazz and what, whatever. The writings are in the back row, and uh, most writers will try poetry before before they find their own genre, and was no exception. Here's at 19th and uh, poem typescript for the girl in the restaurant or Jessica whoever she was never to grow old my dear nor loose the trace of laughter from your eyes nor liquid music from your voice which now you sprinkle over silver it begins <laughs> <laughs> from the obscure to the most famous the next is the final draft of Invisible Man with Corrections, 1952. Even on this, there are, there are uh, uh, writings uh, on the final draft. We have many other drafts uh, of Invisible Man. We have the notes for it. We have all kinds of um, reprint material and reviews, a complete um, uh, archive of, of Invisible Man, which uh, has been much used. Um, to study the evolution and style of, of, of Ellison. Lots of revisions, lots of scribblies. 
Um, but this, of course, begins, I am an invisible man. No, I am not a spook, such as those who haunted Edgar Allan Poe, nor one of your Hollywood movie echoplasms. I am a man of substance, of flesh and bone, fiber and liquids. I might even be said to possess a mind. I am invisible, you see, simply because people refuse to recognize me. Um, then in the blue paper, I have the Hickman novel. That's what we had to call it because that's the way he left the title at his death. And archivally, it's the Hickman novel. And um, the blue paper has an episode draft. He liked to write in episodes, both for Invisible Man and for the second novel. Um, and he would keep these in alphabetical order rather than in the order in which they would appear in the novel, which may have led him to major chaos on the second book. This is Hickman and Bliss at the hospital. It's a typescript, undated, and literary executor John Callahan edited and published the unfinished novel posthumously, as you know, June, June, as Juneteenth, 1999, and then with Adam Bradley in an expanded form as three days before the shooting, 2010. Um, this is the seminal scene around which the novel was reconstructed for the 2010 publication. Set in the frame of a deathbed vigil, this story is a multi-generational saga and centered on the assassination of the controversial race-baiting U.S. Senator Adam Sunraider, who is being tended by Daddy Hickman. Mrs. Ellison, by the way, knew somebody named Hickman, and we have a book in the rare book room that's inscribed from him. This elderly black jazz musician in the story, turned preacher, had raised the orphaned Sun Raider, he called the child Bliss, as a light-skinned black in rural Georgia. And then, in talking about structure, as one of our speakers did, on the easel is um, an outline for the first 100 pages of Ellison's un unfinished novel, chapters one through eight. And it's a meticulous outline in which he really was working with the structure. I found this in part two. I don't know how many people have seen it. I have a message into John Callahan to verify the handwriting. Um, it's possible that it's Fanny Ellison's handwriting, but Ellison's writing changed a lot. And I think he was trying to struggle here with an effort to gain control over the many overlapping episodes and rewrites sprawling over several decades. And then the last item on the back row is the author's memoirs, unpublished, unfinished, one of two folders that we have, the original typescript, undated, but it's clearly after 1984, since it was a date on the verso of some of the pages that he used uh, to recycle the paper. And this section covers childhood and youth. And it's, written, it's, it's all written in the second person. It begins, when you were a young boy in Oklahoma, you daydreamed wildly of adventure. And it goes on. And some of the material is reminiscent of um, leaving the territory in his, his other writings. The second row is um, a small selection from the vast correspondence. Uh, I begin with. Um, Ellison's 1957 reply to William Faulkner concerning, in part, Ralph's opposition to the proposed release of Ezra Pound from St. Elizabeth's Hospital. Uh, from his position at Random House, Faulkner had been organizing prominent authors to issue statements against foreign tyranny, as in Hungary in 1956. This is Ellison's measured response um, many of the authors, by the way, did agree to sign. I do not, however, agree to the freeing of Ezra Pound. Pound is, as you say, a great poet, but I can't see this as a reason for, the freeing, for freeing him any more than I could see the Rosenbergs freed because of their particular professions whatsoever, even had they been the first in their fields. Pound sub committed treason, and if what the Paris edition of the Herald Tribune states is true, he continues from his rooms at St. Elizabeth's Hospital to encourage the treasonable activities of John Casper. Thus, since his confinement does not interfere with his side of, 
with this side of his activities, I cannot see why it should interfere with his creation of poetry. And it didn't, since he, uh, he wrote some of the cantos from St. Elizabeth's. And then uh, Faulkner's letter is beside that. Um, in deference to the uh, Poetry Office's sponsorship of this event, I decided to select just a few additional letters from former LC Poetry consultants out of a wide array of many other authors I could have chosen. The most used correspondence, actually, are the Langston Hughes and Richard Wright files, and also the copious files of letters between Ellison and Kenneth Burke. The Hughes and Wright files became so worn that we had to make copies and retire the originals from service. So the next little item is from William J. Smith. And it's a cover letter for a, a printed poem of his, Winter Morning. Poets do this since Frost that I know of send out beautifully privately printed um, poems to their friends on the holidays. Dear Ralph and Fanny, this is 23 December 1967. We've just heard the terrible news about the fire. How ghastly. I hope you were able to save your manuscript and that 1968 will bring you only the best um, of things. With affectionate greetings, Bill. Of course, that's the fire that destroyed most of, of the Hickman novel manuscript. After that, um, now, William J. Smith served as consult poetry consultant in 1968 to 1970. After that is a, um, Ellison to Robert Penn Warren. It's a computer printout. He loved technology. And we have printouts, I hope, of everything that he put into primitive computers. Uh, this is a draft letter to Robert Penn Warren, 1971. It refers affectionately to their long friendship. Warren served as Library of Congress poetry consultant 1944 and 45, and then again as the first to be designated poet laureate in 1986-87. I won't read it. You can look at it yourself. Um, the last item is William Meredith, a midnight, lovely holograph poem written out, sent to the Ellisons as a Christmas greeting in 1978. And this is one of a series of such poems in this file in part two of the Ellison collection. Uh, Meredith served as poetry consultant in 1978 to 1980. And when you uh, read it on the blue paper at the end, it has a marvelous use of the five senses, uh, which poetry teachers always tell us to use. Uh, it shouts out, and you can smell it and hear it, and uh, I, I recommend it very much. These letters sample the wide value of the R Ralph Waldo Ellison collection in research many major 20th century artists and thinkers. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Uh, please do come up and uh, look at the tabletop display if you'd like. Uh, thank you also to our readers, to uh, Jabari Seaman and uh, Daniel Evans. We have uh, books by both of them for sale in the back, and um, uh, we have Invisible Man for sale as well. So if you want to uh, stop and, and get a book and, and have one of our readers sign their book, I'm sure they'd be happy to do so. Um, I hope we see you again. Our next Literary Birthdays event is actually on, I believe, Monday the 26th, featuring uh, William J. Smith, uh, reading from his new book called My Friend Tom about his relationship with Tennessee Williams. So uh, you can check our website, too, and find out more about our events. But thanks for coming. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.